You are back with Mike Agarbo and John Beeler. We uh, want to explore something uh, right now that's affecting a lot of the restaurant uh, industry. During the COVID-19 pandemic here, obviously we're not hitting the restaurants. We are ordering from them and a lot of them are using these food delivery apps, be it uh, Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes. Today, we wanted to dive into that a little more to help the listeners understand how that all operates, where the money is going, and is this working for the restaurants in general? We've got a great guest on the line. His name is Alex Fraser. He is the Vice President of Western Operations at the 15 Group. Thanks for joining us today, Alex. Great to be here, Mike and John. Thanks for having me. I I find this fascinating. I I know a few friends that have uh, restaurants, and I would say you know, a lot of them, they've had their own delivery drivers since the beginning of the time. And they're continuing to stay with that because they, they say they can't afford these, uh, these delivery food apps. Uh, maybe you can tell our listeners, you know, the basics of how they, they work, you know, how, how they make money and, you know, how they're helping the restaurants. Yeah. So, you know, with, with third party delivery apps, you, you see three components to what they do. They, uh, they one, they charge a setup fee to get going, uh, two, uh, they then take uh, a percentage of the sale, uh, that the restaurant, um, is, uh, is taking on that. Uh, and that is anywhere from 20 to 30% that they take that the restaurant loses on each order. And, uh, thirdly, um, you know, they've, they've done an incredible job at setting this business or these businesses up. Uh, that's great for the market, but not necessarily great for the restaurant. Um, because often, you know, that 20 to 30% that they're charging on each order is, is really, uh, eating up the, uh, profit that uh, a restaurant would typically take, uh, on that order. So, it's been an interesting uh, time over the last, uh, you know, six and seven weeks uh, from the pandemic because I, I feel like it's a bit of a reckoning um, a period where uh, this has now shone light on uh, how these uh, third-party apps are set up and and what kind of impact it has on the restaurant. I, I can see the the pros and and the cons. Obviously. It's a central place. Uh, it's kind of like a, a marketing advertising tool for these restaurants that are participating because, you know, so many people are using, you know, for example, like a skip the dishes or, or Uber eats. And it's so easy to go in there and find exactly the type of restaurant you want. It's so, uh, convenient. Um, right. but to your point, you know, the, the money that goes out, uh, to, to these delivery apps, it's, it's a lot. And you know, my restaurant friends, they're not, their margins on on their food, they're not killing it. You know what I mean? It's not like double digit margins in in many cases. It's just like single digits. So I fundamentally do not understand how they could make money using these delivery apps. Like it's kind of uh, almost a necessary evil because if they're not on it, they're not going to get the business they they want because all their competitors are on it. But if you're giving out 20 to 30% commission, like how much profit does that leave? Yeah, it doesn't leave much. And it's such a great point, Mike, because uh, what, what we see is, is um, they've done an incredible job at, at um, intensifying the need for third-party apps in the delivery market. And what they've done is they've, they've positioned it really as if you don't have a third-party app, then you're, you're not really uh, getting yourself up into the market. And, you know, let's break this down for a second. You've got, um, you've got very quick serve small takeout restaurants using third-party apps. And if you have tremendous volume, meaning that your concept is set up for that, then third-party apps maybe makes uh, better sense because you now have so much volume that uh, your price and structure can allow for uh, that to happen and make sense. If you're a mid-sized restaurant that's more of a sit-down restaurant, you've got a few things to consider. Now with the pressure of feeling like you need to have this out into the market and be available for the market, you're now adapting your model to have delivery drivers come into an environment that typically wasn't set up for takeout. So imagine you're, you're dining with a friend and you're having a great experience and there is a constant supply of um, delivery app uh, people coming in to pick up uh, their, their takeout um, and now it's disrupting the service. So. Um, it, it's a challenge in that regard. And, and also those types of restaurants 
the business model isn't set up well uh, to do that because they're not that smaller quick serve model that is making their money on the frequency of ordering. I think you brought up an interesting point, Alex. The the notion of sitting in a restaurant, having a nice meal with somebody, and then watching a driver come in and pick up a bunch of food. But that happened to me a, lo- a while ago, and I actually watched the driver and what they were doing, and they were actually filling their trunk with these delivery bags. <laughs> and it was like, wow, that's a real big turnoff. I don't want you know my food to be sitting in the back of a trunk with somebody else's food. Who knows when it's actually going to get to me? And the apps do show you the timings, but it's just not as good as getting a dedicated driver from that restaurant, bringing it right to you straight. Yeah, it's a great point, John. I, I mean, you've got that disconnect of brand as well, right? So you, you know, when you have your delivery driver that um, you've employed for a number of years, uh, there's uh, there's a connection there. There's someone that's representing your brand in a way um, that's not only best for you but also best for them. Um, so we, you know, we we see that model having a different um, impact, if you will, um, and, and and also, it, you know, this may lead to in the future uh, models um, really building out the. Uh, footprint of the restaurant to have a really dedicated, great pickup spot. And you see so many of these in New York um, where you'll find uh, one part of the bar which is segregated enough that you're not impacting the actual great uh, experience that you've created with atmosphere. Um, And now uh, you've worked all day, uh, the kids are at home, you're going to pick something up, you're going to go in there, get in and get out and not be disruptive. And the other part of that is I don't want to go in and disrupt a great evening by coming in and getting takeout. So it may lead to um, some different footprints in the future where the restaurant takeout, uh, where we're, we're promoting people coming in uh, to pick up their food and, and leaving is, um, is built out a little bit more uh, in a commerce way and a little bit more efficient to the, uh, the overall experience. So we're, we're looking uh, again at the overall profitability for a lot of these restaurants. You know, we're talking about the 20 to 30% commission. I've seen some jurisdictions and cities uh, trying to enact bylaws on limiting the amount of commissions. I believe San Francisco was what was one of these. Yeah, San Francisco and Seattle for sure. And you know that's a, you know that's a, a great point because we're you know I'm really interested in finding out if this might be a reckoning uh, for governments to uh, and municipalities to uh, cap what the delivery fees are uh, in the future. Um, and uh, you mentioned San Francisco and Seattle have uh, have started that uh, program, and I think that might be um, you know something that's very uh, interesting and, and potentially great for uh, the industry. And it, it also is going to um, shed light on other opportunities for delivery. And you mentioned you know the, the uh, in-house delivery driver, and, and the challenges around that can typically be insurance. Um, but we've also seen things um, that have come out from this. Um, we have a client, uh, Pigeon uh, Restaurant in, in Gastown, and Brandon Basuti, uh, a great, uh, smart young man that has started from two, uh, and it's in the beta stage right now. Um, but essentially, um, it's a delivery service that he set up uh, that has no transitional uh, transaction fees, uh, no percentage of gross taken. Um, and uh, it's a little bit more control uh, on the restaurant side to uh, how that's working. So uh, from2.ca is something that uh, I think we'll be launching uh, later this month. So, you know, there is uh, some silver lining in, in all of this potentially uh, for the future and a potential cap and also some other opportunities for delivery uh, uh, services and how they work. I, I also uh, I'm concerned uh, with a lot of these restaurants, especially during these times, you know, they are, so dependent on these delivery services. Uh, you know, Vancouver people might not have seen this story, but in Toronto, uh, there have been outages with uh, Uber Eats, for example, that uh, have hurt a lot of the restaurants uh, during those outages. I think there was one example of a bakery that was losing like $6,000 a day in business because Uber Eats went down. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. When, when you're relying on your business model to be something that um, is not in your control, then there's that, uh, that challenge and, and potential pitfall uh, of being so um, dependent uh, on it. But, you know, I think we're also in a little different um, of, a, of a landscape here with the, you know, with the density that you see in most urban cities in the U.S., um, you know, you see a good combination of both stop in and take out. Uh, we're in Canada. I think you've, you've got less of that. So um, it's not, uh, you know, that Toronto example might not uh, be resonant of, of what happens in Vancouver or Montreal as, as an example. How sustainable do you think these delivery services are over the long, long haul? 
<laughs> the restaurants are making money. And I know it sounds like a lot of money, you know, the 20 or 30% commission that they're getting, but they are spending, you know, dump trucks full of money advertising their service. So, you know, are, are these delivery services like Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes, are they profitable? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure what their profit model looks like. I know that Fedora has uh, has announced that they will be closing their uh, operations uh, in Canada, and um, you know that goes back to the uh, the model that they have with um, delivery drivers being on bicycles. Um, if you don't have that urban density uh, and opportunity of market, then you know that kind of model is is going to uh, to suffer. But you know, I, I'm very interested to see if there is a moratorium put on uh, pricing structure in the future. And, and what the model will look like. And if it is that 15%, which has been the benchmarks for San Francisco um, and, uh, and Seattle, I, I'm wondering if, if they're going to be able to survive or again, it's going to lead for new opportunities for local uh, businesses to now start delivery services that, that bring money back into the local economies as opposed to going to um, you know, somewhere outside of the local demographic. For our listeners who are concerned, you know, for their local restaurants, you know, I don't think any of us want to see our local restaurant go under because, you know, they couldn't afford to keep open. What are some tips for them to, to uh, you know, to help their local local restaurants? Yeah, great question. You know, we've we've seen, and I should mention, we've seen a, a great response from from local uh, communities trying to support restaurants. And there's a few things that that they can do. Um, one, any opportunity to purchase gift certificates uh, at this time that might be used once we go through the phasing stage is certainly something that uh, infuses cash into their model. Um, secondly, if there's a, an availability of going to pick up. Uh, your order at the restaurant, then you're not paying that third party fees that that uh, entire sale goes right to the, the restaurant itself. Um, and I think staying connected with um, with restaurants. I mean, uh, I know that many models now have been modified. Uh, and there's new opportunities because a restaurant that you may not get into for a month might have a uh, new program that's uh, a little bit more market friendly. So uh, try and stay local and try and support as much as you can with ordering direct from the restaurant. We're talking with Alex Fraser. He is uh, a restaurant uh, consultant that uh, helps uh, restaurants become more profitable. He's uh, the VP of Western Operations over at the 15 Group. Uh, give us your web address there quickly. Yeah, it's uh, www.the15group.com uh, and www.the15group.com. Thanks for joining us today, Alex. My pleasure, gentlemen. Great to connect with you.